In a world filled with blogs, chats, texts, social media, and interactive, always accessible information, teachers need to work harder to keep students engaged in their classrooms. Coming up on Campus Conversations, we explore innovation in education at Montgomery College. Hi, I'm Sophia Reeves. And I'm Marcus Rosano. And this is Campus Conversations, the show that brings you in touch with your community and your community's college, Montgomery College. Today we are exploring some of the ways Montgomery College makes learning more engaging for students. College President Dr. Darian Pollard. The good stuff, the real innovation, like Montgomery College's combat to college or writing in the disciplines program, starts at the ground level. It starts with innovative faculty and staff identifying a need and shaping a solution. Montgomery College has a real opportunity to invest in our experts, our faculty and our staff, and to lead higher education by embracing research and development that benefits student learning. That is why today I am proud to announce the creation of an innovation fund. A fund that supports cutting edge ideas with financial resources, and a fund that helps the ideas of the future become a reality. With us now are Kelly Rudin, a history professor at the Germantown campus, Danielle Stusky, a former student of Professor Rudin's, and Professor Melissa Lismi, an interactive technologies pr professor at the Rockville campus. Thank you all for being with us today. Um, let's start off with Professor Rudin. Before we get into uh, the more technology-based uh, classes, let's talk about engaging students through a different form of innovation. And you had a seminar uh, for the Renaissance Scholars at the Germantown campus, which was a resounding success. Um, and it was World History Through Star Trek, and Danielle was one of your prize students. So tell us a little bit about that. Um, the class examined the themes of history that have been playing out for tens of thousands of years and are still occurring. And the idea is if they are the themes of history, then they're going to continue into the future. So because good Star Trek, uh, I'm sorry, good science fiction like Star Trek, written by Gene Roddenberry, examines the human condition, it's only understandable that the history would the themes would continue on into Gene Roddenberry's vision. So we would watch Star Trek and relate it to the history that the students had read and relate it to what was going on it, right now in the news. Okay, and how did you um, how did you go about pitching that to the department? Um, this is a somewhat unorthodox, I guess you would say. Right. Um, well, actually, because it was going through the Renaissance scholars, it had to be an honors course. It had to meet all sorts of criteria in terms of the amount of reading and writing and the level of scholarship. Um, but the Renaissance Scholars program allows a lot of interdisciplinary play, um, a lot of intellectual creativity on the part of the faculty, especially the students. So what was fun about it was since it was a brand new course and a brand new idea, I handed a lot of it over to the students. So they, right. they drove a lot of it. That's right. So since the first day, Professor Rudin asked us, uh, I want to hear from you. I want that you tell me the, which, which uh, for example, which clips you want to see it, which series, that kind of uh, uh, thing. And uh, so it was from day one, she asked uh, our opinion, our input, and uh, obviously we contributed. And um, that even ended up um, changing how our, our final would be. Okay. Uh, because since Professor Rubin said from the beginning, I'm making this class with you. So uh, we, when she asked us how we would like, uh, you know, what, how we do we, should we write an essay? How should we do our final exam? We decided to do a communal grade. That's right. Mm -hmm. And right. that was very exciting. Some people would ask us, I'm like, weren't you afraid of having a communal grade? And then we were like, not really. And that has to keep all of the students engaged because you rely on one another. Right. Yes, yes, that's right. So like, and we know each other, like, a, yeah. not only from that seminar, that's only seven weeks, but we usually we have studied with these people on other right. 
courses. So we really know each other and like, uh, like if I don't feel like really strong about something, we know that there are other people that are strong. So we complement each other. So it, that makes the class fun because it's, we are learning with the students, with the professor, and uh, that's, that's a very um, neat experience. How exactly is it different than a standard history class? The Star Trek seminar? Um, actually, when I teach, I like to have a lot of student engagement. Um, and a lot of times, um, what is going on in the news will drive the way we cover something in class. I think that's a huge way to, to make students engaged because history can, by nature, be in the past and doesn't seem to apply. But if you look at what's going on right now um, with the revolts in the Arab world, um, every one of those countries is responding differently and all of that has to do with what their history and their culture is. And um, so um, as we, you know, whatever history course I'm in, if you connect what's going on right now mm -hmm. and look at the, um, what went on um, throughout history leading up to this point, it, it makes it much more relevant. Um, I also try to get students to actually put themselves in the, in the place of people reacting. So this concept of a communal grade, we're such an individual driven society. You know, um, I'm not going to let anybody threaten my grade. Um, and yet, if students can let go of that and work communi communally and interactively, not only are they learning more, but they can understand people in other places at other times that have chosen a much more communal way to organize their society. So they, they actually are existing the way other people have existed. Professor Lizmi. Can you tell us about your classes and projects and also specifically the GPS app for ecotourism? Ecotourism allows developing countries to uh, sustainably build their economic base. Uh, so what this is about is um, South Africa. This idea came about when I attended a conference in South Africa. And one of the things that they had there was an elephant park called Addo Elephant Park. And the way they were keeping track of these elephants was simply when they had the money, to, uh, sending out a grad student to hand count them. So I, we, I came up with the idea. I thought we could do better than this. So we came up with the idea, a group of students and I, of taking pictures of these animals. So this is like a safari type of uh, ecotourism, a photo safari really is what we send this uh, do for the people and they would take a picture of the animals that they see and they can using Google API's or Google applications we can act we have the ability to upload them to the web and then display them on a map of Google Earth or Google Maps uh, this way all the information is stored for the user the user can go back and see exactly what they saw where they saw it when they saw it and the exact when we upload uh, pictures like that the date the time, the latitude, the longitude, the altitude of the exact picture. Not only the picture, but all that information is stored too. Wow. And your students are actually building these apps. Yes, That's and they're building these apps. And, yes. and I want to ask you about adapting to the changing technology. Obviously, you're, you're a com computer expert, um, but computers are changing every day. And how do you keep up and how do you keep your students up with the ever-changing, ever-evolving technology that we have for the classroom? It's difficult, it's difficult. Our programs, our classes change all the time, constantly, uh, because technology is constantly changing. So we're constantly moving things out and bringing new things in. Um, but we really, the best way to keep my students engaged and keep them coming is we keep the conversations open. Mm -hmm. We use discussion boards, we, uh, and we use collaborative workspaces quite a bit. Okay. This enables students to kind of meet online uh, and they can upload documents, they can edit docu each other's documents, they can collect information, sort through information. And to me that's what's important right now is that students are learning how to sort through, filter all the information that they're bombarded with these days. Oh, very good. Uh, we have a, just a couple of seconds left. Um, just talk a little bit about keeping students um, engaged in the, you, both of you can answer this question, um, in the information you know, age. 
um, how do you keep their attention span and keeping them um, engaged in class? Um, well, it goes back to helping students understand the humanity behind what they're seeing. They see all these images, mm -hmm. they get all this information, they have access to uh, an unbelievable amount of information in all disciplines, but then the question is, how does it become real to them as humans actually interacting on the human stage? So if they're playing a game in class, a card game where they have to communicate and they don't have language and the rules are different, and then they end up getting violent about it, <laughs> it <laughs> helps, revolts, uh. <laughs> and there's some revolts, um, it helps them understand um, either why imperialism could be a problem, where national independence movements came from, and what's going on right now okay. as people get frustrated. All right. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you. When we come back, we'll talk more about innovation in education at Montgomery College. Stay with us, you're watching Campus Conversations. I'm visually impaired, I'm legally blind. Even though I can commute, it's still a, you know, a little bit of a challenge. It was easier to, to use the distance learning. I'm encouraged, I have so many more options available to me now that I wouldn't have been able to, you know, wouldn't have had because I wouldn't have been able to get out to the campus. Now I have many options available to me that were not available before. If you are a recent high school graduate or even a career changing adult, get your start with us. Montgomery College offers more than 130 programs of study and classes to fit your busy schedule. Apply today. Montgomery College, endless possibilities, 240-567-5000. Welcome back to Campus Conversations. Today we're talking about innovation at Montgomery College. Joining us now are Linda Zannon, coordinator of the Diagnostic Medical Sonography Program at Montgomery College, and Kathy Swanson, a librarian at the Tacoma Park Silver Spring campus. I want to thank you both for being here on this show. Um, I'd like to start with you, Linda, sure. and tell us a little bit about the Diagnostic Medical Sonography Program uh, at Montgomery College, and maybe in layman's terms, um, what exactly it is. Sure. Uh, I think most people know Diagnostic Medical Sonography as ultrasound. Mm -hmm. Uh, because they've heard of obstetrical ultrasound, but we have an ultrasound program that offers uh, imaging in both ob obstetrical, abdominal, uh, echocardiography of the heart, and vascular technology. We've had our program here uh, since uh, 1990, okay. graduated our first class in 1993, and, and uh, serviced the entire metropolitan area for sonographers. Very good. And um, how has, uh, you said it's, it started in 1990, and that is a long time when you're talking uh, technology. Um, We've come a long way in talk technology. Talk a little bit about um, how it has adapted to 2011 now. Uh, well, I can definitely remember teaching in a classroom with a chalkboard. Uh, and I don't moving. think our students know what chalkboards are. They uh, don't, anymore. and in the little cellophane kind of uh, rollers where we would write and project up on a screen. Uh, we have been extremely fortunate uh, on the Tacoma Park campus, uh, Silver Spring campus. Um, we have a new health science building. We mm -hmm. have tremendous technology in that building. Um, our classrooms are all outfitted for, um, for our students to have technology in the classroom. Um, we have state-of-the-art ultrasound equipment that we've received uh, through grant money. We have computers. We have laptops uh, that the students use while in the classroom. Of course, our internet service, so, so the students are constantly uh, online, uh, engaged in a variety of different ways. Our program is an online blended program, okay. and it has been for about the seven, uh, last seven years. Um, we are currently using WebCT and, and very excited about moving towards Blackboard uh, this upcoming fall. Very good. How have you been able to communicate with students using the iPad? Well, we communicate with our students uh, many different ways. Um, we use, we use uh, synchronized learning, uh, like through Illuminate. We use asynchronous learning, uh, like through technology like uh, Jing. Uh, we use collaborative learning, like through wikis. 
uh, blogs. Um, we have Facebook for our alumni to, to join mm -hmm. us. Um, we, we use a lot of different technology and iPads is something relatively new that we started using uh, just this past fall semester and it's not really, uh, we don't expect our students to have iPads but all of our faculty do and as our uh, faculty go out to our clinical affiliates and visit our students off campus because our program is not just on campus based, it's off campus based with learning, uh, our uh, faculty engage with them uh, with their clinical tracking. Uh, all of our clinical, um, uh, our students clinical based learning is done electronically now. Our students do come into our program with iPhones, Androids, uh, an iPad, uh, an, excuse me, an iTouch where while they're at clinical they actually enter all their patient data mm -hmm. for all the studies that they're participating in for that day. Our students um, are able to enter that data our clinical instructors are able to enter um, and complete evaluations on our students that way and then our clinical faculty uh, are able to pull that information up on the iPads, uh, evaluate the images, the ultrasound images that they've done, evaluate the type of information that they've entered regarding their, their patients uh, that they've engaged with at clinical. So, so we use it more off campus when, when we're at clinicals visiting with our students. Okay, well, Kathy, speaking of cutting-edge technology, <laughs> MC libraries um, are really, uh, you know, into the new information age. Um, tell us a little bit about some of the newest resources uh, that are with uh, uh, MC libraries, and of course, we have a redesigned MC libraries webpage that I was on today, and it looks fantastic. Well, thank you. Yeah, we worked hard on that, and the nice thing about being a librarian is, in information, we do have to keep up with the new mm -hmm. technologies, and we certainly have to make sure that people have access 24-7 in this day and age. And we do, we have a lot of good resources. We do encourage the students to go to our library webpage because we, they can access it 24-7. Right. We have the databases where they can get the full text articles. We have the online catalog. And we actually include electronic books now. So again, they can view this material off campus mm -hmm. or in the library. We've, um, we've incorporated um, course pages now, subject guides, research subject guides that the students, they used to call them pathfinders and now they're interactive where a student, if, if they're in a biology class, can go to our research subject guide online and look at the resources that would be helpful for their biology class. Okay. It includes websites, databases that could be used for that particular course. You know, and it's in conjunction with working with the faculty. That's really important to us, is what, to get their feedback. So what does this. this mean for the card catalog? Yeah. <laughs> Does it well, still exist? Online. I mean, okay. there's still paper books, yes. So there's still access to what it is. It's now online. Right. So instead of, obviously, the card catalog, you can search it. And we do include that access not only, of course, on our web page, but in our course pages and our research subject guides. So students can search anywhere, anytime, and uh, see if it's available and come in and get it. Or if it's an electronic book, look at it right there mm -hmm. and then. What do you mean by 24-7 access? It never closes? The electronic, yeah, the online resources never close, yeah. Even if they can't come into the library, they still have access to our, cat, our library web page, mm -hmm. which gives them access to all the databases off campus, on campus, and they can do their searching. Our books, electronic books certainly, not the paper books, but the difference being if they're off campus, they may be, they're, there will be a login because we pay for all this, but it's accessible to them. We also have 24-7, if they have a question, we actually have Ask Us Now where they can write a question mm -hmm. and there'll be a library librarian somewhere in the world that can answer it. Mm -hmm. Or we have our own FAQ in-house online question and we answer it within 24 hours. So even off campus, they can send us their questions. And, about and what about some of the tools for faculty? Oh, as the faculty research uh, services page, I'm actually the faculty outreach librarian, mm -hmm. and that's what our goal is, is to reach out to faculty, because we want their feedback. We need to know how to support them so they can support their students, what kind of material they would want. Um, yes. And um, I want to, this is a question for yeah. both of you. Um, there is so much information out there. Mm -hmm. um, are, they, are the students in 2011 in danger of information overload? and how can they pick out the information that they might need for you know, either passing a test 
or doing a term paper? There is, I think it's overload for faculty as well as for, as for students uh, trying to find the information that you want to present to them right. or, or steer them towards. Uh, I think as Kathy said, um, the, the library's gone 24-7. Our courses have gone 24-7. Mm -hmm. When you offer an online course, they're looking at four resources and, and, and looking towards services that are 24-7 mm -hmm. because that's when they're, you know, they, they're online and, and, and they're learning when it's um, convenient to them. Right. They're not tied to a specific time and day that they're coming on campus to learn. Um, Kathy's done an incredible job uh, with her outreach to faculty mm -hmm. uh, and that helps us find the material that we need to help guide our students towards the material that, that they would need to look up. Uh, we have web links that we, we encourage our, our students to visit. Um, we, you know, we are constantly telling our students what we present to them in a book format is already out of date. They right. need to go online. They need to take a look at what the newest and the latest is in technology uh, and in research because that's now, that's today. Um, it, it, is, it can be technology overload. I think I'm one of those instructors, though, that is very much meat and potatoes. If I'm steering you in this direction or, or providing you these kind of links to go to, it's because it's essential. You really need to know it. The peripheral stuff you can do on your own, and there's lots and lots of that. That was a lot of excellent information, and I want to thank you both for, uh, for being here. Uh, we're going to take a short break, and when Campus Conversations returns, we'll take a look at more innovative approaches to teaching and learning at Montgomery College. America's economic prosperity in the 21st century will depend on cybersecurity. With over 1.9 billion people online across the globe, cybersecurity jobs are in high demand to protect our public and national security. Master today's technology by enrolling in the Montgomery College Cybersecurity Program. We prepare entry-level computer technicians with expertise to enter the workforce or transfer credits for advanced degree opportunities. Apply today. Montgomery College. Endless possibilities. I'm visually impaired, I'm legally blind. Even though I can commute, it's still a, you know, a little bit of a challenge. It was easier to, to use the distance learning. I'm encouraged, I have so many more options available to me now that I wouldn't have been able to, you know, wouldn't have had because I wouldn't have been able to get out to the campus. Now I have many options available to me that were not available before. Not all Montgomery College classes take place on campus. Online courses are very popular with our students as well. I'm Dr. Michael Mills, Director of Distance Education and Learning Technologies, and what our office does here at Montgomery College is work with faculty to develop online and blended courses, and then also work with faculty to incorporate technologies into the in-class uh, environment. We have several types of distance learning here at Montgomery College. Uh, one type is the fully online class. We also have a number of blended classes where the faculty and the students work together online, but they also show up at a prescribed time on campus, and part of the instruction is done in class. Distance education is a different delivery method than an on-campus class, but the rigors are the same, the academic standards are the same. It's just a different way of delivering a class. Students who are interested in distance learning go through the same admissions process as students who want to take on-campus classes, and then the registration area, the counseling area, are all available for distance education students as well. We have a great, great set of faculty who are teaching distance education. We also have a very great uh, support system for students. We have a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week help desk where students can call if they need technical help. The good thing is that the material is available 24 hours, seven days a week. So if they're working during the day and they only have the evening to access their course material, they can do that. Or if they're an early riser, they can access the material four or five o'clock in the morning. Uh, but it does take a special individual to do that. Not every student is cut out for a distance education class. People who are successful in distance education are those who are self-starters and very good at time management. Uh, they have to take an active approach to their learning uh, 
the faculty member will often provide resources, then it's incumbent upon the student to read that information and then discuss it with the rest of the class through a discussion forum. One of the misconceptions that students often have when they first get into a distance class is that it's self-paced. And what they find is that they will slack off and then try to catch up at the end, and that just doesn't work. These classes have same deadlines as on-campus classes. Assignments are due at certain times. There are dates for tests. And if you wait to do that, you're gonna fall behind. We have a variety of classes, from the general education classes, uh, English, math. Uh, we have music online. Uh, there are some art classes online. Opponents of distance education who say, you cannot be as engaging in an online environment, I think are, are missing something because we can do just about everything that you can do in an on-campus class online, but it requires a little bit more thought to do that. Uh, Students who take an online class are often better writers because much of what they submit is through the written format. We're also seeing that a lot of on-campus faculty are bringing in online components. So we have faculty who are teaching a class strictly on campus, but they're supplementing their material with an online presence, uh, combining the best of both worlds. And I, I think the students appreciate that, uh, and it, it makes for a richer learning experience. Students are more engaged through the computer than, than ever before. So using discussion boards, email, chat features becomes second nature to them. Uh, faculty have really taken it upon themselves to incorporate a lot of different technology into their class to make it as rich an experience as possible. There's a lot of interactivity, there's a lot of interaction to make the learning experience as good if not better than an on-campus class. The reason distance education has grown, especially here at Montgomery College, is because of the convenience that it offers students from a scheduling standpoint. It allows them to schedule classes and complete their studies when they're working or when they're dealing with family issues. So I think it was as much convenience as anything else. Students who are interested in distance education have a couple of options. They can call our office, 240-567-6000, or they can go on our website, which is www.montgomerycollege.edu slash distance. And there they'll find a, a bunch of information dealing with distance education, but there's also a pre-assessment that they can take to see if distance education is right for them. It, it will ask them a, a series of questions and then have them self-select in the scoring, but it'll give them a good idea of whether they should enroll in a distance education class. If they have further questions, they can talk to a counselor who will also provide some information for them. As you can see, innovation is in full swing here at Montgomery College. Who knows what the future might bring? Thanks for watching Campus Conversations, the show that brings you in touch with your community and your community's college, Montgomery College. I'm Marcus Rosano. And I'm Sophia Reeves. See, see you, you next time. time.